Hey, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another review. There's another paid request, this time Vante. And for those interested in requesting pretty much any type of videos or topics or commenters, reactions, pretty much any type, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. But this is for Blues Brothers 2000. And we got Dan Aykroyd coming back from the Blues Brothers. We also have John Landis directing. Of course, Belushi had passed away long, long ago. So they add in John Goodman, Joe Morton from the film Speed and Terminator 2. You have appearances at the end by people like Aretha Franklin. Pretty much Dan Aykroyd gets out of jail because of the events of the first movie. He waits all day and the warden, played by Frank Oz, who's a director of films like Bowfinger, he's the guy who voiced Yoda in Star Wars, he comes out to tell Dan, by the way, your brother Jake has died. And this movie is really lame. It's a lame sequel. It's a sequel that did not need to be made. Because Belushi's gone. That tells you... You can't make the sequel. I like the original Blues Brothers. Is it one of my favorite comedies ever? No, but I thought it was pretty decently funny. Acro and Belushi worked well together. You have the blues music, but you actually had some really good action sequences, including going through a mall. And This was a tired, lazy, unneeded sequel that maybe if you're the most hardcore blues guy you'll get enjoyment but then it's like why don't you just get the soundtrack instead of watching the movie you just listen to the songs whether on YouTube on CD to set whatever or instead of watching the movie cuz this is John Landis in the era of doing Beverly Hills Cop 3 of doing the stupids Susan's plan this is the John Landis you got. Now, John Landis, I think he's a piece of crap person for what he stupidly did on the Twilight Zone, the movie set, would cost three people's lives. And even the trial was going on, he still got hit box office films, trading places, coming to America, among others. Spies Like Us. And I like some of his movies. To be fair, Animal House I liked. American Wolf in London I liked. Spies Like Us I liked. Coming to America I liked. I mentioned Blues Brother. Just he's a piece of crap person, and when he got started to the nineties, his talent or what little he had, whatever you want to call it, it went downhill. It went downhill fast. It was a downhill slope. And he drowned in it. I mean, I mean, when you do stuff like The Stupids with Tom Arnold, you make a horrible sequel like Beverly Hills Top 3, which I know Eddie Murphy didn't help in that matter, to be fair. And I feel like this, you go, yeah, John Landis, he lost the touch, he lost the talent. And this story just, number one, it makes the first film pointless. Because for those who don't remember, the whole reason... They were doing all this stuff and get the band and do the song was to save the orphanage. What happens at the beginning of this film? Dan Aykroyd goes to Mother Mary, the orphanage is closed. So, well, everything they did in the first film that led them to go to jail was pointless. So, did Jake die in prison? Belushi died in prison? And then, we're talking about the character, not. Belushi, of course, but the character. So, they did all this to get in jail, and then Jake dies in prison, I would assume, and it was for nothing. And the movie's so stupid, they don't realize that, but then they want to say, this is in honor of Belushi, and then other people like John Tandy, and people who we lost since the first week, because John Tandy was in the first film. I'm sitting there going... I like the first film. Those who are hardcore, hardcore fans of the first, you'd be pissed. Wow, the orphanage was closed anyway, so that was completely pointless. Great. 
And then the new characters were nothing like Dan Aykroyd. Belushi helped in the first movie. They're back in, you know, they're close to chemistry. Dan Aykroyd by himself, not so much, especially in this age where he was doing films like Exit to Eden. It was a far cry from the Dan Aykroyd of yesteryear. I mean, he worked better in supporting role like Evolution a year after this. No, actually, no. This is 98, that was 2001. Around 98. This film did not do well. Although, for some reason, Gene Sisto gave this a thumbs up. But Roger E. gave it a thumbs down, as it should. And the new tier, like John Goodman. I like John Goodman. But... It's like, okay, we got him because he's overweight. He sings a bit. But he's like, what, a bartender at a strip club, and there's nothing to his character. He just hangs around, and there's nothing, there's no development of his character, there's no arc of his character, there's no transition of his character. It's just, he's a bartender. You don't join the band. Okay. What band? And then he's just along for the ride. And there's no knockout funny gags with John Goodman. Joe Morton, he has a of the supporting, he has the most development because he's a police officer who's related to Curtis from the first movie. And he's like, what are you talking about? Then he finds out from his mom that, oh, this was his real dad. And then as a cop, he's chasing after them. Then when he's in a church or whatever, and James Brown and such are talking to him. He flies into the air and I guess Tinkerbell douses him and he becomes a bluesman. It's just these events that happen that are not that funny. It, it works badly as a comedy. It's not funny. It's not entertaining. And I did maybe people will just wait for the musical numbers. I don't, I don't even care about the songs. Maybe because I'm not a big blues guy. That probably doesn't help either. But my... I mean, what songs are you going to listen to afterward? Respect, I mean, by Aretha Franklin. You had that in the first movie. Only this is at a different location. What, are you going to sit down and listen to... 6, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9. 6, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9. And that's one of the more... Titchy songs. 6, 3, 4, 7, 5. I mean, 5, 7, 8, 9. Where are they like a sex phone operator? <laughs> By the way, yeah... This has a strip club and a sex phone operation, or love line, but then you also have this little kid named Buster, who's an orphan, that joins the group. Now, at least he's not annoying, because he barely has any dialogue, but he's still, still sitting there going, I guess he's there, so it's like one passing his knowledge of blues to a younger generation, because at the very end, it's Dan Aykroyd and the kid that go off on the run. But, you, again, you sit there, you're doing... We're getting the band back together. For what purpose? There's no purpose of getting the band back together. What is the purpose? What is the goal? What is the evolution of the plot? What is the end-all, be-all, end-game of the movie? They go to battle the bands, and they lose! But then they're happy because the guys they played up against, the other band, had BB Teen and Isaac Hayes, who barely used to do anything, Eric Clapton, Travis Tritt. So, of course, you know, they won. But it's like, okay, they went to this battle of the bands to see and what came of it. I didn't even the first one, it was, oh, the Save an Orphanage, which didn't matter because it was close. What did this do? What did this accomplish? 
Nothing. So what was the fucking point? And then this tries to be even more fantastical and ridiculous and silly and stupid. Like to escape the cops, Dan Aykroyd has a head that is shaving cream man. Everything here is shaving cream. He comes out like a 50s, 1950s monster movie. A John Drum is like, hey, get out of the way, get away. It's like this, it's like one, someone put like a white suitcase on his head. Shaving cream monster, the high from the tops. They drive underwater at one point. They're seeing ghost riders in the sky, and literal ghost riders in the sky appear. Skeleton horses breathing fire and skeletons. Of course, they appear, and then they do nothing. So I'm like, they appear in the sky. So you already brought up some silly, stupid fantasy element, but then you don't even follow up with it. Because they don't do anything. They don't do anything to the people below. Or they mess with the bad guys. Or nothing. So why did you even make them appear in the first place? You you make people laugh at you. Not with you. And then even when you do it. You don't do anything with it. So it comes off as pointless as well. I just they thought it would just be a funny sight gag. What just came off as stupid. Or there's a bit where they're hiding in the car and they open up like the ashtray or something and Dan Aykroyd's face is in it. Like they open like the, again, the ashtray, whatever the hell, glove, cover, and then there's Dan Aykroyd's chin and he's talking to him. I'm like, this is just, wow. John Landis came a long way from, from comedy. This is that I'm getting into the voodoo, the voodoo lady, that at one point turns Dan Aykroyd, John Goodman, and a third into green Frankenstein monsters in order to do the Caribbean music. When Weekend at Bernie's 2 is more real than your movie, that's a problem. And Weekend at Bernie's 2 is a better sequel than your movie, that's a problem. I would rather watch Weekend of Bernie's 2 than this. I'm not joking. Maybe people can enjoy, hey, there's James Brown, uh, there's Blues Traveler. But again, the songs, I didn't, I was indifferent on. Aretha Franklin respect again you could hear you did have that in the first movie they did you, you're just watching the first movie six three four five seven eight nine blues traveler which is <sighs> blues traveler goes hey can I join you Dan Aykroyd says yes they get their car and it drives like a dick and then blues traveler just Really doing the band's doing the song for themselves, <laughs> and then after it's done, he comes back. Elwood finally realizing that they're gone, and you don't even have much action compared to the first movie. Maybe John Landis is skittish of that after trials on the movie, which is understandable. That's why you hire people that know what they're doing and go, you guys do this. But there's one car pile up So the, for the trailer, it seemed, for the movie trailer. <clears throat> so they had not nearly as extravagant as the first movie. So cause sometimes you can watch Blues Brothers, the original, as an action movie. And you look at the cast, you got people like John Candy and Carrie Fisher and here... Who do you have? Frank Oz is the warden. I mentioned you James Brown, B.B. Teen, Aretha Franklin again. Like I said, John Goodman is wasted in a nothing role. 
Oh yeah, I forget the when the three of them after being the Frankenstein monster, they turn into plastic. Literal fucking fucking plastic. And so oh yeah, by the way, they're chased by the Russian mafia and white supremacists. Which I know there's like Nazis in the first one. And because Nazis are so far separated because of there's a forget it number one it's like okay we need to it, this comes off almost like a remake of the first one at times get the band back don't go to a place to scene while the cops are after you as well as instead of Nazis it's the Russians and a white supremacist group Or I guess you could say that. So. Oh, and the, the guy, the guy leading the white supremacists, I think it's Daryl Hammond, who was on Saturday Night Live for a while. Sorry, I've been bumbling my words. Oh, and the voodoo lady turns them into rats. Russian mafia, white supremacists. She literally turns them into rats. I know the Blues Brothers is not realistic. But it wasn't science fiction. This was science fiction. I just, they thought that would equal laughs. Oh my god, they got turned to a rat. Oh my god. Got turned to a, a green f Frankenstein monster. I'm like, you know what, this is not a tribute to Belushi, it's not a tribute to John Candy, it's a tribute to John Landis' dying career. Barry Hill's top three, the stupids, this. This is why you would not get much of films going to the movie theater from John Landis. Because what was after Susan's plan, that probably got, what, maybe direct a video? And ask my friend Mike OCP. He'll tell you how good good that movie is. And you just say, I mean, this is the final gear shift in his career all the way down to fucking hell. Where he belongs. Screw John Landis. Screw this movie. I mean... If you like the music, you just listen to the soundtrack. You can listen to it on YouTube. You can, I don't know, maybe you can find the CD somewhere on eBay, probably for five, ten bucks. Just listen to that. The dance scenes, the dance numbers, eh. The. No one asked for a sequel, especially one when Belushi is gone. John Belushi, long gone, may he rest in peace. And John Candy, may he rest in peace. Someone. And also like Curtis from the first movie, he passed away. So why make it? I don't understand what was the... Who was the brainchild and said, let's make a Blues Brothers of today. Maybe John Landis, like, I need a hit, and this is one of my early hits... Although, even at the time, some were not sure if the original was a hit or not. So, it's, it's not like the Bruce Brothers was a $100 million... I don't know, maybe eventually, but... It wasn't like a mega blockbuster like Star Wars or something. That's what I'm getting at. So, Blues Brothers 2000... I think this also got a really crappy Nintendo 64 video game... You know, people turn to rats, driving under waters, a little kid named Busta. Busta? Yeah, bust your ass. Go bust your ass, John Landis. Dude, it's a tribute to your dying career. Adios, machachos. So, we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.